if you kind of think of people uh, as families and you you talk about um, the the saving across generations um, and sort of think of them as one unit, um, there's a particular point where um, any um, assets in the uh, family's possession uh, get reduced. And that's the point um, where the bequest is made. And so um, what a lot of elderly people are faced with is a trade-off of, of, of spending um, a dollar or a pound on my, myself today um, or uh, leaving, say, 75 cents or, or 60 cents or, or 80 pence to um, uh, to my heir. Inheritance tax is back in the news after recent figures revealed that tens of thousands of more families will be paying the impost over the coming decade as a result of frozen thresholds and skyrocketing rates of inflation. Now, advocates say inheritance tax is necessary to deal with people getting unearned wealth as well as societal inequality. Whilst critics claim the concept of death duties is fundamentally unfair, double taxation, as well as economically damaging. Welcome back to the IEA podcast. My name is Matthew Lesh and I'm the Director of Public Policy here at the IEA. Each week, this podcast asks a tantalizing policy question to a top political and economic thinker. This week's question is, is inheritance tax wrong? To discuss, I'm very excited to be joined by Alan Cole, who's a senior economist with the Tax Foundation's Center for Federal Tax. Alan has served on the prestigious uh, Joint Economics Committee of the US Congress, and he's also studied at Yale University and the Warden School. You might have also heard Alan on NPR talking about issues ranging from uh, kind of proper assessments of Trump's tax plans through to questions about inflation. So welcome to the podcast, Alan. It's very exciting to have you. Thank you, Matthew. Very excited to be here. So Alan, you're ultimately a, a tax um, fiend. I'm kind of interested in, in terms of, uh, I suppose a bit of background, like why do we have inheritance tax? What is, what is meant to be the purpose of, of tax people's inheritance or in, in the US case, people's estates? There, there are two basic purposes. The first is to raise revenue, and the, the second is, is uh, a kind of more equality of opportunity uh, centered idea. And um, perhaps you could al also uh, say it, it's about stewardship of, of wealth. And um, I, I've seen arguments made that, that um, wealth passed on to later generations is in the hands of less capable people than the people who initially created the wealth. Uh, so you have two, maybe three arguments um, in its favor. And, and the arguments against typically go something along the lines of? Um, discourages saving, um, particularly saving beyond the point of, of death and uh, transferring over to um, heirs in the form of bequests. Um, Discouraging saving uh, can have further effects on the economy that um, that we could discuss more at length. Um, and the the other impact that's worth considering is that it's fundamentally a lot harder to assess, especially relative to the amount of revenue it raises, uh, than more typical uh, taxes based on, on um, say, income, um, especially labor income, where you've got very regular arm's length transactions uh, that the uh, revenue service can simply take a piece of. Um, it's much more difficult when there hasn't been any arm's length transaction. There, there's no objective valuation. And you have to do this kind of unusual style of tax collection uh, only once every couple of decades. Um, that's a lot trickier. So it's kind of expensive, relatively expensive to collect. I think another case here, which seems to come up a lot in the UK sense, maybe slightly less in the US sense, although I'm sure it's similar, which is the richest of the rich end up managing their tax affairs in such a way where they don't really pay any inheritance tax. Well, it kind of ends up hitting people who maybe suddenly die um, or people who are, uh, are incapable of getting professional support to manage their taxation. Exactly right. Um, it's effectively quite possible to design um, assets that are confusing enough, um, that, that don't have enough obvious uh, comparable um, examples that, that you can value them easily. And um, 
the the taxpayer will will look to create those and look at past rulings and find something favorable um it, it's very very tricky especially um with anything that that isn't publicly traded or cash um you know stocks and cash um stocks that are on the uh, on the open market are one thing uh but but businesses real estate um the, those are key to some um, medium and high value estates and they are much much harder to value um and of course you then you mean. then get in there of um I suppose, like a dead weight loss or an opportunity cost, which is there are a lot of professionals who probably spend their time planning people's tax affairs to minimise inheritance tax rather than doing something more productive and useful with, with their time and effort. Yeah. Um, anytime you have smart people um, really going at loggerheads over distribution, um, the, the greatest problem with that for society is just that the smart people are employed there rather than elsewhere where they they could be making contributions to growing the size of the pie rather than fighting over uh, the distribution of the existing pie. So I'm interested in, and I know you've done some work on this, Alan, unpacking this point about um, inheritance tax impact on savings. I think there's something, you know, Milton Friedman in, in his kind of famous letter now signed by hundreds of economists on inheritance tax, he, he makes this, the, the point that inheritance tax discourages kind of what you want, which is people to, to, um, to save and to, to you know, I suppose, hold something off rather than spending today. I wonder if you go through the logic there. Why is it that inheritance, I think this is not necessarily instinctively understood that well. Why is it that inheritance tax discourages people from saving? Well, um, if you kind of think of people uh, as families and you, you talk about um, the, the saving across generations um, and sort of think of them as one unit, um, there's a particular point where um, any um, assets in the uh, family's possession uh, get reduced. And that's the point um, where the bequest is made. And so um, what a lot of elderly people are faced with is a trade-off of, of spending um, a dollar or a pound on my, myself today um, or uh, leaving, say, 75 cents or, or 60 cents or, or 80 pence to um, uh, to my heir. And so it's not a direct trade-off. And in fact, that, that 20% can be a kind of very steep, um, that could be a very steep uh, loss. Um, as estate tax rates in the US have, have bounced around over the years, I, I'm sure the, the same is true for, for the UK. This, just an illustrative um, number, but but um, the, the the basic point is, is that there is a point in time where you are incentivized to spend your money on consumption for yourself um, and spend it down relatively uh, quickly or much more quickly than you would otherwise. So, so practical terms, this, this is saving. this is the decision, which is basically: do I go on another holiday and just spend my money today because I know the tax man is going to take forty percent of it down the track if I leave it for my kids, or do I not take that holiday, or do I not buy that yacht or whatever whatever else it may be, and I leave it in my bank account? If I leave it in my bank account, or you know, invest it in equity, or uh, invest it in a, a new kind of entrepreneurial opportunity because I know I can get greater returns from that. Um, that's the kind of on the margin that's the decision people are making here. And and so if people are saving less, then I guess what that then leads to the next question is like, what is the broader economic impact of, of less saving? Um, with less saving, uh, you, you've got less money going into capital assets of all kinds that, that can include uh, stocks, that can include businesses, that can include housing. Um, to some extent, uh, savers just bid up the, the prices of, of um, assets that are already around. And to the extent that they're doing that, um, we shouldn't worry about um, the quantity of saving. But, but at the margin, they also do fund the investment uh, into uh, new projects. Um, or they can also um, contribute to a country's kind of net international investment position, um, which is to say, um, of the assets in the UK, how much it, of them are actually owned by uh, people in in the UK and of the assets abroad outside of the UK, how much stuff abroad do uh, UK people own? And the more that UK people save, the more they can 
uh, buy those assets uh, worldwide. Um, it could be anything from from uh, football clubs to um, <laughs> to to uh, American stocks uh, to uh, buying back uh, real estate in uh, London that might have been owned by foreigners uh, for a time. Um, any of those things um, that makes the um, the UK richer in the long run if it saves more or uh, poorer if it saves less. Um, the, the net international investment position where you're just um, owning a greater share of the world's assets, uh, that actually doesn't change GDP, uh, gross domestic product, but it does change gross national product, which is kind of more a measure of uh, the income that, that uh, UK people have rather than uh, the uh, product uh, the production that is attributable to uh, activity when the, within the UK's borders. There, there are slightly different measures, but uh, GNP is the one that's more affected by saving. And it's also a more accurate reflection of kind of the wealth of a country. Yeah, so I find this quite interesting. So you, you, as a case of, I suppose, almost unintended consequences or, you know, kind of second or third right consequence of, you know, you put in place an inheritance tax with the intent of, you know, I suppose, raising a little bit of revenue, although you know, we can discuss the fact that even in the US, it only raises something like $20 billion. In the UK, it's only like 7 billion pounds, like 1% of total revenue. But as a consequence of that, you have all these delirious effects, which is misallocation of capital into professionals spending all their time dealing with tax issues rather than dealing with more productive activity. But on top of that, if on the margin when it decreases savings, um, you know, that then leads down to less investment. Less investment leads to, as we know in the UK, um, less growth because we've had very low business investment and very low growth for over a decade now. Not, not necessarily because of inheritance tax, although it certainly doesn't help. Um, I, I think there was some modelling you did that I was looking at from a little bit old now, maybe perhaps out of date, but it but ultimately reached this fascinating conclusion that not only does inheritance tax reduce GDP by 0.8%, but it redu reduces GDP by enough to ultimately make the economy smaller where the government gets on net less tax revenue. So if you, if you have a bigger economy, because people are saving more because you don't have inheritance tax, you could actually have not only a bigger economy, but actually more government revenue as a result of that bigger economy. Yeah, um, that, that um, what was the modeling result we, we reached uh, uh, about um, in, in 2015. Um, I, I know that, that um, we, we've uh, made, made some changes to our models since then, and um, it may be a little more uh, oriented towards GNP and um, GNP being lower uh, without GDP necessarily being a as much lower because um, some of the effect is, is not that the country becomes less productive, it's just that it owns less of its stuff. Uh, but um, over the longer run, that does mean some lower tax revenues. So, you know, if I, I sell off an asset um, or um, it, um, in, in order to fund consumption, then uh, the government can no longer tax me or my heirs on the returns to that asset. Uh, so, so there's a little bit uh, of um, slaughtering the golden goose, as it were. Um, it, it's a relatively small tax. It, it's it's not going to have a huge effect of, on the economy, no matter no matter what's done. Uh, just because uh, most money is actually spent by the people who earned it. Uh, but, but uh, bequests are, are large enough that, that it's worth considering the policies. And um, it, it's fairly yeah. possible that the uh, estate or inheritance tax just isn't worth the squeeze, all, all things considered. Yeah, I mean, it, it's also uh, you know, relatively expensive for HMRC, for Majesty's Revenue and Customs, to, to raise the amount it needs from it, I, I can imagine, because it's, it's not such an obvious tax, to, as you've said, to figure out you know, the value of people's assets. Another way, I don't know whether you consider this in your modelling, but you certainly hear this anecdotally, at least, that people sometimes leave the UK and, and you know, opt to make sure that they die in another jurisdiction, which you know, obviously takes at least for the years, those years their assets um, and their income and their spending away from the UK, which would obviously also have a negative impact on, on UK tax revenue and, and, and UK GDP or GMP. Uh, yeah, I, I've definitely um, seen a few cases where 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 that happens, and, and often it's with, with the the very large estates that actually drive estate tax revenue. Um, there, there's always a, a bit of, of um, squishiness of, of money, um, and there there was an economist, um, uh, F. P. Ramsey uh, from 
from about 100 years ago, and he noticed that, that taxes are most efficient when they uh, go after something that's less squishy, that's um, less um, easy to move around. Uh, um, and um, some of this insight gets you to the idea that taxes on land are very efficient, and, and that, that's another economist called Henry George. Uh, but um, uh, Ramsey's observation is a little more general than that. And, you know, it's very hard for people to move where their jobs are. Um, the um, US and the UK are going to uh, be where people work. Uh, but um, there, there are a lot of ways to move out of um, estate taxes between uh, the consumption versus saving margin is one way. Uh, there, there's uh, moving wealth offshore. Um, there, there are um, a lot more options there. So you've got an inherently squishier base. Um, and that that just means that the tax is going to be less efficient in a number of ways. And, and once you try to pounce on the revenue, uh, you'll find that there's less of it there uh, than you thought there might be. Yeah. And in the end, a lot of countries have gone along the path of abolishing their inheritance taxes. And most, fast, most um, fascinatingly, even the likes of Sweden and Norway that people normally associate with quite kind of left wing politics have chosen to get rid of their inheritance taxes. I think there's only like another 15 or so, 10 or 15 or so jurisdictions that have removed their inheritance taxes in the last few decades. Yes, the, there's a fascinating uh, effect where um, the US is perceived as um, essentially the, the world capital of, you might call it right neoliberalism, uh, kind of um, e economics favoring uh, free markets, lower taxes and, and so on. Um, but because the US is large and has relatively less competitive pressure, uh, whereas Europe is fragmented, often you see um, Europe uh, being more competitive in these areas where there are kind of squishy taxes, um, where, where the money can move from one jurisdiction to another. Mm. Um, and, and that is something that you also see in, in uh, corporation taxes um, on multinational corporations. Um, Europe for a long time was unable to sustain uh, tax rates uh, as high as the U.S.'s uh, corporate income tax rate. Yeah, I'll, I'll come to that next. I mean, it was is interesting case in my home country in Australia that the reason why inheritance taxes were abolished is because they were a state-based tax. And once one state, I believe it was Queensland, abolished their inheritance tax, people started moving to Queensland, sunny Queensland, the, you know, the, the Australian Florida, basically, in order to retire, which then led to an incentivize every other state to also get rid of their tax for that uh, exactly the same reason. Um, though you've given me a perfect segue to talk about corporate tax, because I wanted to spend the, the kind of last bit of this conversation um, looking at some of the more recent work you've been doing on what's called OECD Pillar 2, which you know is, is a bit of a, a, a jumbled way of saying that the, the, the um, uh, developed countries' agenda for global minimum taxes. I was wondering if you could describe what the, the OECD is trying to do here um, and give us just a bit of background uh, about what they're, 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 the way they're trying to, I suppose, restructure the international tax system. Um, the OECD uh, Pillar 2 agreement is based on a theory, um, and that theory is that corporate income taxes will eventually be competed down to zero or near zero. Um, they call that uh, uh, often a race to the bottom. And uh, the goal of, of the Pillar 2 Agreement's provisions is to arrest that race to the bottom at least at a kind of minimum of 15% uh, that would be enforced globally through a uh, variety of different uh, tax mechanisms. And importantly, um, countries that are in the deal uh, would be able to uh, enforce this on countries or small jurisdictions that aren't in the deal uh, through um, essentially uh, appealing to the um, logic of the Pillar 2 agreement saying that we signed this and, and we have the right to go after tax money and ensure that any corporation that's within our borders is paying 15% globally. Yeah, so that's th this kind of uh, you know, designed to be ingenious clawback mechanism where if one country doesn't play ball, then they could potentially be losing tax revenues through other countries who, who choose to play ball and tax yes. international organisations. Um, 
be, before we get into a little bit more about why that's proving so controversial, I'm kind of interested in unpacking the difference between the kind of tax rate and the tax base. So I think this is quite a big issue, even, even in the UK, where despite the fact that um, corporate tax, in fact, has just gone up to 25%, um, there's increasing numbers of, uh, I suppose, base narrowing that's been going on here. I mean, the UK's introduced at least some level of uh, expensing system. Let's talk about things like free ports um, that, that could bring the effective rate well below 25%, potentially even below 15%. And if, if I'm understanding this correctly, if the rules are different between different jurisdictions, you could still end up with British corporations, even with a 25% tax rate, being taxed somewhere else because of different interpretations of the tax base. Absolutely. Uh, there's no um, single definition of income that's uh, accepted uh, throughout the world in all contexts uh, as the correct definition of income. And for that matter, there's actually not totally a an accepted definition of tax either, <laughs> um, especially when it comes to tax credits, kind of things where, where the revenue service gives you money back, uh, perhaps because you did something that the government wanted to incentivize. Um, and so we're, we're both here from, from uh, countries that have, um, at least nominally, uh, corporate income tax rates above the 15% threshold by, by a comfortable margin. Uh, but that's scored by our rules, by, by um, the laws passed by our legislatures. And uh, our, our legislatures ha have um, handed down rules to corporations and, and um, even if they are following all of the, the rules as um, given by their home countries, um, the rules for Pillar 2 and OECD are just different. Um, and the, the, there's nothing um, nefarious about that. It's, it's just the defining income at the extreme margins when, you, when you, you've got complicated things like, like uh, say, uh, written off inventory that you weren't able to sell when when you've got assets with with a, an unclear um, uh, amount of time that they they are are going to be with you and uh, an unclear pace that they're going to depreciate. There are lots of reasons that people can disagree. Uh, so the danger is that that your business could be doing everything right by the standards of its home country. And then it ju gets judged by completely different rules and found to be uh, below the appropriate 15% rate by those OECD rules. And then um, it's subject to penalty. It's yeah. as if you were, say, playing baseball and then uh, you get judged by a uh, referee from cricket or vice versa. Yeah, so that seems to raise a few issues in my mind, which is not only that countries are potentially under this international agreement giving up their capacity to lower their taxes below 15% and kind of associated, I suppose, sovereignty issues with that, with that um, but also they're losing their capacity to, I suppose, design their tax system in a, in a way that they might want to incentivize certain activity like investment. It's, it's really uh, a, a very kind of, I suppose, in some ways reversal of the way that the tax is a sovereign responsibility. It's, it's, it's not usually something that's designed at this kind of level, the, the, the way you do taxes. Normally a country is able to compete in these ways. I suppose that's what they're trying to stop, but it does seem like a very much a very big reversal of principle here. Uh, yeah, the, there's nothing like this in, in the recent past um, or um, I, I guess in the far past either. Um, the, this is unprecedented. Um, Particularly, uh, the most unprecedented idea is that a company, say, headquartered in London uh, with a, let's say, a small subsidiary in Croatia, um, if the, the company headquartered in London is not uh, globally paying 15% by the OECD rules, uh, and uh, the UK were not compliant with Pillar 2 and, and didn't assess the tax itself, uh, Croatia could actually go after a uh, UK company, not just on its Croatian income, but on its global income. And that that's a, a very unusual idea. That's not something that's been done before. Obviously, um, if people agree and uh, get used to the system, then um, that would be a new part of international law. 
Uh, but there, there are people in the U.S., and especially because the U.S. has so many uh, large global corporations and is used to having more control over how they're taxed. Um, there, there are um, members of the, the U.S. legislature who are, are very against uh, this particular aspect of the deal going forward. Well, indeed, this seems to be one of the biggest issues the deal is facing at the moment, which is the, the U.S. Congress doesn't seem particularly likely to approve um, the, the, the deal uh, as it currently stands, divided Congress requires big majorities in order to, to get it through. So you could be in a situation where countries other than the US are trying to tax uh, US companies based upon their domestic earnings in the US. Now, uh, to, to the American um, Congress and, and American taxpayers, that seems like a really rotten outcome you're reaching. And in fact, the UK could kind of end up, in a, I suppose, in a similar situation as well potentially as well, um, where it's, it's losing a lot of revenue to other countries as a result of this, this tax scheme. Um, and, and then I suppose the question becomes, do other countries have the guts to tax US companies in this, this big way? Yeah, that, that's a, a big open question. Um, I think uh, so certainly um, the, this mechanism was designed uh, mostly uh, to uh, stop uh, very small jurisdictions with kind of nothing to lose and everything to gain for, from uh, currying favor with, with corporations. Uh, think like small island countries. Um, if um, you, if this rule did not exist um, and uh, companies found a way to actually, um, at least nominally for tax purposes, headquarter themselves on, on a small island nation that agrees to, to have very low tax uh, tax rates, then you really need something li like the under tax profit rule, um, the which is the in extraterritorial enforcement mechanism we discussed. Uh, you really need something like that to work. But it, it feels a little bit different uh, and perhaps incorrect um, to, at least from an American's perspective, perspective to have uh, very small countries going after the entire U.S. tax base. Um, and at least one approach to this uh, espoused by some of the Republicans on the Ways and Means Committee, which uh, is uh, the, the the kind of word for the tax committee in the U.S. House of Representatives, um, they say we're going to treat this like a trade war and we're going to hit back. Um, and and uh, if it's all countries in concert uh, re ready to um, enforce this deal as as written, um, then it might be hard for the U.S. to to fight in a trade war. But certainly, if you're just uh, one small country, uh, you wouldn't want to be the, the first one to pick a fight with the United States, um, especially, <laughs> I'd say, like, g given um, the, the current geopolitical circumstances yeah. where the U.S. is kind of doing a lot to protect Europe's eastern flank. Well, it, it may not be war, but it could be trade war um, down the track, or at the very least, I, I suppose it's still questionable in my mind whether or not Pillar 2 will, will actually be able to go ahead as planned if the U.S. doesn't come on board um, and for the reasons you've said, it's, it's a little bit more controversial and, and more difficult to implement politically than people are supposing. Um, Alan, it's been absolutely fascinating and uh, discussion from uh, inheritance taxes through to corporate taxes. Uh, both, as we've said, have their, their kind of interconnections through uh, the way in which mobile uh, people and capital are mobile. Um, thank you so much, Alan Cole, from the Tax Foundation for joining the IGA podcast. If you are enjoying the podcast, please do subscribe on your chosen podcast provider. Uh, and if you'd like to learn more about the IA, just visit ia.org.uk.